Good morning, Daybreak. Hi. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Hi, Daybreak. Good morning, Daybreak. Good morning, Daybreak. Hi, everyone. Hello, Daybreak. Good morning, Daybreak. Good morning, Daybreak. I hope you are doing fine. Good Sunday morning, everyone. On this fall Sunday, October 18th, 2020. Thank you for tuning in for these moments of worship and interaction together. I want to begin today by um, asking you to be in prayer for a woman from our congregation. Holly had a stroke. And so I would like to invite you to join me as we begin our time together today by lifting up to the Lord, Holly, and uh, any others that you may be aware of, either in our congregation or in your circles, that are in particular need of a touch from God on their physical health uh, at this stage. And so join me as we come to the Lord in prayer, please. We are thankful, our Father, that you know all things. And that which surprises us, that which shocks us, is no surprise and no shock to you. And so today we lift up to you, our friend and your child. We thank you, Lord, for preserving her life. We thank you that uh, the ambulance and medical attention was able to get there in time. And we give you special thanks for uh, the ability of our health system to do immediate surgery. And so in this day, when we hear so much criticism of our healthcare system, uh, we do want to thank you and we want to celebrate uh, the many benefits that are ours as Albertans and as Canadians with the type of competent health care. God, we ask for strength for your child. We ask for wisdom for all of the medical team involved. We ask, Lord, for ongoing faith and hope for the family members. We take a few moments to lift up to you, those in our own circle who stand in particular need of prayer this day. Some of them, Lord, have similar situations where they are in urgent need of a physical touch from you. And so we ask for that in faith. Some, Lord, are in need of encouragement because of financial setback. They're in need of a strengthening of their faith by virtue of some of the testings that the COVID matter has put them through. You know, Lord, the challenges that are before your people who are praying with me in these moments and their loved ones. And so we appeal to your sense of all knowingness and to your compassion, and to your spirit of healing and comfort to draw alongside those that we lift up to you as we enter worship this day. And we give you thanks that you are the all-powerful God who promises not only to hear us, but to help us and to extend hope to us and so we take confidence by being reminded of these truths as we pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. I have been asked by Church Council to update you regarding the finances of Daybreak. We have tried to put regular reports in Breaking News, which I hope you know goes out by email every Thursday evening to keep you somewhat informed as to our financial realities 
uh, during this uh, season of COVID. Uh, nonetheless, um, I had a candid conversation with some of our finance people this past week. And then last night, Wednesday night, council had its monthly meeting. And uh, I was asked to inform uh, everyone by uh, this means of uh, our financial realities. Folks, the simple situation is this. Um, the offerings that have been coming in uh, have not been sufficient to sustain our expenses, which have necessitated the importance of our being able to access uh, government funding throughout COVID. And uh, we have done that right from the very beginning. Um, nonetheless, when the government gives, there is also the reality that the government takes away. And those subsidies will be ending uh, within the calendar year or by the end of the calendar year. And that makes the fact that our offerings to date are simply insufficient to pay our bills, which, as you can appreciate, is of great concern to me as your pastor, of great concern to all of us on Daybreak's leadership team. Now, Council has discussed a number of options, and we are continuing to pray and discuss uh, options and try to think creatively. One of the things that uh, our finance people have noticed uh, throughout COVID is that most of our income comes through the Sunday morning offering plate, which means that since we have not been having services, at least for the first six months or so of COVID, the offering plate has not been circulated. And we are feeling the effects of that reality. Some of you who do online banking have faithfully supported us via that means, for which we are very thankful and appreciative. But uh, the people that track our donations have informed me that uh, many people who, for obvious reasons, have not come to worship on Sunday morning uh, have not been sending in their donations. And that's part of the shortage, uh, the reason for the shortage that we are facing. And so uh, Council has uh, asked if I would inform you that beginning this Sunday, October 18th, Following our afternoon interactive hour at the church, so approximately 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock Sunday afternoon, someone will be at the church and ready to do a curbside pickup, which means that if you have financial donations that perhaps have been sitting on your counter, and uh, you've been meaning to get them to us, but uh, for obvious reasons haven't been able to get that done, uh, simply because it's inconvenient to swing around to the church when you're not coming here to worship, whatever. Uh, we want to do our best to facilitate uh, accessing those funds. And so beginning this Sunday from 5 to 6 p.m. on Sunday late afternoon evening, uh, someone will be uh, available at the church, meaning that all you need to do is drive up in front of the church and someone will be watching for you and will come out to your car and uh, receive whatever envelopes you wish to give them. And in that way, we hope that we can access some of those funds that uh, we have not been receiving. And so we're trying to make it as uh, simple and as convenient as possible. 
and perhaps we should have done this sooner. Uh, but at this point in time, as we look at the reality that some of the subsidies which have enabled us essentially to keep our doors open uh, this far into COVID um, are coming to an end quite quickly, uh, we are in a position where we need to humbly ask for your financial support and ask you to get those funds to us in whatever way possible. And so we are making uh, ourselves available uh, to uh, convenience your being able to drop off uh, uh, a donation. And so we wanted you as a leadership team, we wanted you to be aware of that reality. So again, to summarize, beginning this Sunday, October 18th, from 5 to 6 p.m., someone will be at the church watching for you to drive up to the front and just uh, do a curbside drop-off of your donation to the church. And uh, hopefully that way we can do something about the shortages that we are facing. So thank you for your sensitivity to those realities. I ask you to be in prayer for your leadership team as we look at uh, a troubling situation um, and try to discern the best way forward uh, given the realities of our financial realities. And so um, thank you and we ask you, Lord, uh, we ask you to be in prayer to the Lord for uh, our financial situation uh, because uh, it is not looking very good and it is of great concern to us uh, in leadership. So your prayers and your sensitivities to those uh, realities are deeply appreciated. One of the realities of this COVID season is that it has forced me to remain flexible as I go about my everyday activities. There's always something that uh, seems to surface, requiring that we change direction in our efforts to try and present some kind of meaningful worship experiences for you uh, during this season. And uh, just to elaborate a little bit on that, for example, today, we are going to celebrate the Lord's table together in just a few moments. The reality is that the way things have unfolded with various regulations and committee meetings and all that have had to be accommodated is that if you were to attend our in-person worship service at the church today, either this morning or at four o'clock this afternoon, you would not experience the Lord's table because COVID restrictions at in-person services uh, prohibit that given where our relaunch committee is at in its deliberations. So if that's confusing to you, it's as it should be. I'm confused too. Um, so we are going to celebrate the Lord's table in our online worship this morning. But uh, there's another reason why I'm doing this. And that is because of some of the challenges we have had with respect to live streaming our services, the service that is being conducted simultaneously at our daybreak facility, as I'm speaking to you this morning, is recorded so that it can be shown to you next week. And so uh, what you're going to be seeing in coming Sundays is last week's service just from a number of perspectives, this has been necessary in order for us to accommodate certain realities that we are trying to remain flexible on in order to bring you a meaningful worship experience. 
So you may remember that a couple of weeks ago, in our series based on Psalm 34, we were looking at verse 15 of the psalm. Um, no, actually I'm wrong. We were looking at uh, verses 13 and 14. And verse 13 in particular, when I was preparing for that message, I was preparing with having communion in that same service in mind. That didn't happen for a number of interesting reasons that I won't get into. But I want to remind you as we come to the Lord's table this morning of the contents of Psalm 34, verse 13, and then build on that in our moments of communion this morning. David makes this directive in Psalm 34, verse 13. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. And you will recall that uh, we spoke about that a couple of weeks ago uh, in our morning service. What I want to do now is to conduct the communion service that was supposed to be a part of that service a couple of weeks ago. And I think you will see the connection that I'm making between the verse that I just read to you about the importance of learning to control our lips, to control our tongue, to watch what we say. And you may remember my reminding you that that is difficult in and of itself, learning how to control our mouths. Let alone, when you add to that, the fact that we now live in the communication era, where there are many more ways to communicate than there used to be. I'm so old I can remember when the telephone was the primary means of communicating outside of your house. Well, now, thanks to the iPhones and modern technology, as you know, there are several ways that we can communicate to people to the point where it gets very confusing at times. So frequently, in an average day, when I attempt to respond to someone who has contacted me, I find myself going through this little mental process. How did that person contact me? Was it a phone call? Was it a voicemail? Was it an email? Was it a text message? Was it something they sent by messenger? which is an online communication device? Was it something that they sent via Facebook? Was it something that they sent to me via Twitter? I think you get the point. I find it difficult to remember how that person contacted me, and sometimes it takes me a few minutes to go through some of these and figure out oh, that's how they contacted me. So I will respond Accordingly, one of the things I try to do in my pastoral work is respond to people in accordance with how they initiate contact with me. If they phone me and leave a message, I do my best to phone them back. If they text me, I will respond by text. If they email me, I will respond by email and so forth. So you get an idea of, of the point I'm trying to make. So with all these various different means of communication, 
that we have at our disposal these days. The admonition from David to watch our mouths has a bit of a broader application. Watch what you say in a verbal conversation with someone face to face, in a verbal conversation with someone over the phone, in a verbal conversation with someone via email, in a conversation with someone via text message. There's all these different ways that we communicate, meaning that David's directive to guard our mouths is something that we need to be aware of more frequently than we used to be when all we had was the face-to-face -face communication or the telephone. So we need to hear and understand David's directive to us about guarding the way we talk, what we say, controlling our tongues. We need to hear that in a bit of a broader sense given all the avenues of communication that we have due to modern technology. And I'm sure you've heard discussions of how you are supposed to interpret emails. If the person uses all capital letters, you should understand that they are yelling at you. If they use a lot of exclamation points, they feel very strongly about what it is that they are saying to you. And sometimes you don't have to think very hard to realize that the person who sent you the email that you just read is upset. May not be very happy with you. And consequently, you find it tempting to respond accordingly. So what to make of David's words to us to guard our tongues, to watch our lips, to watch your mouth in this day and age of all these different types of communication. We not only need to watch our mouths and our lips, we need to watch our fingers because we're using our fingers as a primary means of communication. And as you know, communication begins in the mind, so really we need to watch our minds, which lead to what we say or what we type. Accordingly, given all of these complex realities, trying to be consistent and disciplined Christ followers it is helpful for us to regularly go to the frame of reference of our Lord Jesus Christ in this regard. And one of the means by which we consistently go to the frame of reference of our Lord Jesus Christ is by coming to the communion table, such as we do this morning. So a couple of weeks ago, when I was thinking through the implications of David's advice to us to learn to control our tongues, to watch our lips, and then was relating that to the communion table, I couldn't help but think of these words, well-known words that you will recognize, that are found in Isaiah chapter 53. And so I want to read these words as a setting for our participation in the Lord's table this morning. Isaiah writes these words, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. 
Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. You can see, I think, why my mind went to those words as I reflected on David's counsel to us to watch our mouths. The supreme example of someone who was self-controlled, someone who knew how to control their tongue, watch their lips, guard their mouths, was Jesus. And he was able to do that under extremely harsh circumstances such as what we remember at the communion table this morning by partaking of those symbols of his broken body and his shed blood i don't know about you but when someone says something sharp to me or unkind to me, or when someone makes a false accusation, or comes to me with a presupposition that is entirely erroneous, it can be very difficult for me in those situations to watch my mouth. I don't like to be falsely accused. I don't like when people say things to me that I know are simply wrong or based on false information. And accordingly, I find it difficult many times to bite my tongue. Let me give you an example of something that happened just this past week in that regard. So on Tuesday evening, I was at the church for a meeting and we were just about to begin our meeting in the fireside room when two or three people that I didn't know walked into the fireside room. Now, as you know, uh, we are a part of the Airdrie House of Prayer, which is presently going through a 40-day period of prayer and fasting. And on occasion, we have had visitors to our prayer initiatives on Tuesday evenings, including the last couple of weeks. And so... When people came in that I didn't recognize, I immediately thought that they were people that were coming to join us for prayer and that they were a part of another church and Tuesday evening was the most convenient time for them to come and pray with other believers. And so I didn't think about it very much until I asked them, are you here for the prayer time? And they said, no, we're here for the Bayside uh, Residents Association meeting. Well, I don't know everything that is scheduled at the church. 
that's not my department. And so it's not uncommon for something to be scheduled that I am unaware of. But our auditorium was already being used by an outside group for their purposes. And the fireside room was being used for our purposes. And I was pretty sure that had there been a meeting of the Bayside Community Association scheduled for our facility on Tuesday night, that Denise would have told me about it. So I got up and went out into the foyer to converse with these people who by this time were halfway down the hallway where our kitchen is located looking for this meeting. And I said to them, are you sure that you have the right church? Because people often get this church and the one across the field, uh, Living Springs Fellowship, confused. And this woman was adamant that they were in the right place. She said to me, no, this is Daybreak Church. And she said it in such a manner that I found it very difficult to keep from saying, ma'am, I'm the pastor here, so I know where I am at. I know what church this is. Thankfully, bless God, I was able to not say that. I bit my tongue. And I said, okay, um, I need to make a phone call here and see if I can get some further information for you. So while I'm in the process of getting Denise's number to call her and say, is there a meeting here of the Bayside Community Association that I'm not aware of? Which can happen, and I wouldn't have been surprised. But as I'm in the process of calling Denise, suddenly another woman comes in, and she looks at the paper that she was holding, and by the way, none of these people are wearing masks. A little interesting side light. And she says, this is Living Springs Fellowship, right? And I said, no. Is that where the meeting for the Bayside Community Association is to be held? And she said, oh, yes. And I thought this was Living Springs. I said, clicking off and calling Denise, no, Living Springs is the church to the west of us across the field. Well, meanwhile, this initial lady and a person that I assume was her husband are yakking away. And when they heard this information, oh, we're in the wrong place. And this other woman said, yes, apparently it's the church across the field. Well, out they all went without so much as any acknowledgement whatsoever that they were sorry to have disrupted our meeting and that they were in fact in the wrong place. And as they went and I reflected on no word of apology, I just thought, yeah, isn't that the way it is so often? And you know what? We've been told that in COVID, people are on edge and all this type of thing. So I want to make allowance for that. And I need to make allowance for that. But the point is this, that so often in the course of an average day, a situation such as the one I just told you will suddenly unfold or suddenly develop and things are said or not said that communicates some very unkind or disrespectful ideas or thoughts. And accordingly, it can be very difficult for us when those situations happen just on the spur of a moment to guard our lips and to control our tongues. Opportunities like that, situations like that, arise without our being prepared for them. And sometimes we can say things in the crisis, the immediate crisis, that we realize later shouldn't have been said. I'm thankful to the Lord that I was able this past Tuesday night in this little situation that I just told you about to keep my big mouth shut 
and let them just realize that, no, the mistake was theirs, and off they went. I'm not always that successful. And, may I suggest, neither are you. Which is why, this morning, it is so important for us, as we come to the communion table, to hear again and to hear afresh these words of Isaiah regarding our Lord. That right at the time that he was being oppressed and afflicted in going to the cross of Calvary, he did not open his mouth. In other words, he made a choice to control his tongue, to guard his lips, to watch his mouth in the midst of a very trying, unfair, cruel, oppressive situation that was unfolding. That's amazing to me. What a remarkable lesson the behavior of Christ in that regard is to us. And we need to learn from his example today and be reminded that we ought to be slow to speak as another part of scripture encourages us to be. My friends, I'm speaking to myself this morning because I can be so hasty to speak and the Psalms refer several times to the fact that in the abundance of words, sin lurks. So as I told you a couple of weeks ago, that old saying, which almost sounds like it came right out of the scripture, better to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than to open it and remove all doubt. A lot of truth to that. Jesus, the one who went to the cross, the one who willingly allowed his body to be broken, punished, his blood to be shed, is a masterful demonstration to us of the very truth that David reminds us of in Psalm 34, learning to control our tongue to guard our lips, to keep our yap shut, even, even when we would be justified in saying something in return. I believe it's Matthew's gospel that tells us that in the situation that unfolded in the crucifixion of Christ, Jesus very easily could have called angels to come and deliver him. But he refrained from doing so. In order for our eternal benefit, Jesus kept his mouth shut. Jesus let people say unkind things, abusive things. Jesus did not retaliate either verbally or physically in the course of his body being broken, his blood being shed. I, as your pastor, want to admit that I so desperately need that spirit of Jesus to guide me and to abide in me on a daily basis. And that's why it's appropriate as we come to the Lord's table this morning for us to think consciously about the example of our Lord who though he was oppressed and afflicted did not open his mouth. I invite you at this time to take the bread, 
whatever it is that you are using this morning, and to break it with me, to tear it apart, because that's what happened to the body of Christ. And to break a piece of it and to partake with me in remembrance of our Lord's outstanding example to us of what it means to keep our mouth shut, difficult though that may be, and tempting as it may be to give a legitimate, unkind response. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Let's eat the bread together. Earlier this week, I was thinking of an experience I had when I was a kid. I'm going to say I was probably in grade six or seven, which meant that my youngest brother would have been in about grade two or three. And uh, my mom was giving piano lessons in our home. I remember that, when into the house burst my youngest brother howling at the top of his lungs, and when he came around the corner, blood streaming from a gash in his forehead. My mother, of course, went into motherly mode and immediately got something to stop the bleeding and I don't remember if he had to go for stitches or just what, but it was a, a significant gash, so he probably did. He had simply been out playing with friends and got into some kind of an altercation. And a kid threw a stone and caught him right in the forehead and uh, cut him badly and created blood. When you see a lot of blood, that's very serious. When Jesus shed his blood on the cross, it would have been very easy for him to say, as I recall my younger brother saying in that incident I just related to you, look what he did to me. Look what he did to me. And of course, we were eager to gather all of the data and the details and to go out and find this kid and do what big brothers should do, right? <laughs> How easy it would have been for Jesus to say, look what he did to me. And to begin to think in terms of retaliation and striking back. As we know, he didn't do that. In fact, Isaiah is telling us that even when his blood began to flow, as he was oppressed and afflicted, he did not open his mouth. That's amazing. That's astounding. That's self-control. And so as you take the juice that you have or the wine that you have this morning. Let's offer a prayer of thanksgiving to God before we partake for the amazing example of our Lord Jesus, the ultimate 
in keeping his mouth shut, even when his blood flowed. Let's pray together. Lord, in these solemn moments, we acknowledge to you that we want to be more like Jesus. In all honesty, we would probably have to say we're not all that interested in going through a similar experience that he did. But we give you thanks today for his willingness to suffer on our behalf and even while he was suffering, to be exemplary in his behavior and in his attitude toward his oppressors. So Lord, as we partake of this liquid today, symbolic of the flowing blood of Lord Jesus, we ask that you would prepare us for unexpected incidents that we will encounter perhaps even this coming week where something happens on the spur of the moment and perhaps our blood even flows. Prepare us, O oh God, to be Christ-like in what we say, what we do, and overall in how we respond. We want to honor our great example by the way we live in this regard. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. Amen. Thank you, my friends, for joining with me on this Sunday morning for this time at the Lord's table. I trust that some element of it has been meaningful for you as we have reflected on the great example of our Lord Jesus as the one to whom we need to look for ongoing motivation and strength to carry out the directives of David in Psalm 34. And so as you go into the rest of this day, as we go into the coming week, I bless you and I affirm again that Jesus is our ultimate example and encourage you to be looking unto Jesus for those unexpected surprises circumstances, developments that can suddenly on the spur of the moment challenge our ability with regard to controlling our tongue. Look to Jesus, my friends, and be blessed. Amen.